So today's lecture will be a continuation of our discussion of solid shafts and torsion. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We're going to do some example, or at least one example problem uh, for the lecture. Uh, however, before we begin that, a uh, couple of uh, news items here, uh, announcements, I guess you would call them. So first of all, uh, as we talked about last time, make sure that you're subscribed to the news notifications that come through eLearning. Um, nobody reached out to me to say they hadn't been getting the email, so maybe that means that you all have been getting uh, email uh, notifications of any new news items that came through. Uh, but uh, just to reiterate, if you are not a subscriber, make sure you subscribe because I've been using the news uh, tool within eLearning as my primary way of communicating with you guys. You know, I sent out an announcement on Sunday about this week's homework set, um, which was sort of with a soft due date due today. Uh, didn't give you much time to do it. Um, I'm not terribly worried about the due date today, uh, but I wanted to make sure that you all tried as soon as is practical to go through and do these two things. Uh, the first one is to do the trial homework submission on grade scope. Uh, Gradescope is a tool I've been trialing this semester, uh, started with this class as the first class to attempt to use it. I'm learning how to use it as I make progress in my learning. Um, I am uh, getting more comfortable with what it does and how to use it. And so this time around, I actually wanted to try a feature that they have which allows you as students to directly submit your homework to the Gradescope website. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like uh, for me. Uh, here's uh, the Gradescope uh, window as I have logged in. And then, of course, here's the Aerospace Structural Mechanics class. And you can see um, the, the interface. Um, the, uh, you know, and, and the interface, of course, has the various assignments that you guys have been given. Uh, over the semester and I can go in here and I can grade your assignments in here. Now you might ask why am I doing this? This is different than probably you've seen before. Um, uh, the answer is, well, there's a number of good reasons why I want to try this tool. Uh, first, I did get the question, why this instead of e-learning? So e-learning has a relatively rudimentary and not terribly useful rubric feature. Now, do you guys know what a rubric is? I expect you probably do. A rubric is just a mechanism by which I can use to establish criteria for grading. So, you know, it's a list of things that I check uh, each of the uh, submissions against. And then, you know, you can, uh, the way I typically use it is I uh, use it to mark down points. If you made this error, then I will subtract this number of points. If you made that error, I will subtract that number of points. Um, and you know, the, the rubric has either been formal or informal for, for years. Um, one of the challenges when you're grading paperwork is just um, sometimes you forget what you've done in the past, and sometimes it becomes a little bit difficult to say, okay, this is similar to what somebody has done, a little bit different. I want to differentiate those two, but I, I need to try and uh, be fair with my grading and, and make sure I'm giving uh, very similar grades for very similar work hopefully identical for, for, you know, what would be substantively identical work. And so that's always hard with paper, especially with paper, because, you know, if I grade three or four sets today and, and three or four tomorrow and then three or four the next week, um, you know, memory comes into play and it, it can be challenging. So grade sc scope helps me to build a rubric as I'm grading so that I can keep track of what I've assigned uh, points-wise for, for all the past homework that I've graded and uh, go back and reference that as I'm going forward and even, even potentially um, alter uh, relatively easily to, to make sure that what has uh, been graded before uh, is graded fairly and equitably across the board for all students. You know, I think that's exceptionally important. It's very much strive to be fair and equitable in all my grading. So uh, Gradescope has that feature. It's really a great way to do it, actually. I'm very impressed, and e-learning has nothing close to it. Uh, for, for applying rubrics. In fact, in e-learning, once you start grading, you, um, you're locked into the rubric and you can't tweak it if you realize that somebody's made a new mistake that you've never anticipated. So anyway, that's the reason for doing it. Um, and I, I think it's going to be fairer for you. It's going to be more complete assessment. You'll actually be able to see the rubric at the end 
um, so that you understand errors that other students have been making in addition to any errors that you might have been making. I think that's also quite useful. And then, um, you know, last but not least, it, it hopefully actually will be a little bit more efficient and faster. And so that's why I'm doing it. Um, thank you guys for being part of the pilot here. Uh, your homework has been graded that way uh, throughout the semester, and I'm getting more comfortable with it as I go. So we're going to try this. Uh, I noticed many of you have already submitted the homework six of e-learning. There seemed to be a little bit of confusion whether it should go into e-learning or a grade scope. Um, so uh, with this trial homework, we're going to put it up on grade scope directly. I'll assess to make sure everything went. And I'd actually like to hear your feedback to see if that was an easy tool for you to use as well. Uh, and if it wasn't, you know, certainly let me know and maybe we can figure out how to do it a little bit better even uh, going forward. So uh, let me see. I'm going to check the chat window. I saw one or two questions came across. Let me see what people are asking. Uh, beam bending not being on the exam. Um, so Jeremy asked, do you want homework to be turned in on grade scope and e-learning? Uh, so for this trial, uh, homework number six, just grade scope was all I was asking for. In fact, a number of you, eight of you to be exact, turned it in on e-learning as well. I emailed all of those people and asked them to make sure it was on grade scope and then I turned off the Dropbox for homework six. So um, if you uh, put it in homework six e-learning Dropbox uh, previously, I didn't delete it or anything, but I'm asking that you put it up on grade scope uh, primarily. And then we'll see how it goes. And if it went well this time, then the next time we'll uh, either continue with what we've been doing with the template for submission and then I upload them or alternatively if it worked well and you guys um, seem to be able to navigate it well then um, we'll just continue submitting to Gradescope. I'm still trying to figure out since I haven't had an assignment that you guys uploaded I don't know exactly how to return them to you yet whether that will go directly from Gradescope or whether you can, um, you know, if I have to download them and, and then re-upload them to e-learning. So we'll figure that out after today is over. Um, so that is uh, this first bullet point here with regard to grade scope. Any other questions on that? And then I'd also encourage you guys, if you have feedback on whether it was easy, hard, um, you know, some experience you've had, please uh, feel free to volunteer that as well. Ben, I see you turned your mic off. So why don't you ask the first question? All right. Um, All right. For the time, um, for the time, assign that to question one, or don't assign anything to it. Uh, I'm sorry, your uh, mic didn't pick up, or something happened. Could you say that one more time? Uh, it's acting weird. Let me put my headphones in. For the title, can you hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yep. Okay. For the title page, do you want us to assign that to problem one or don't assign anything to that? Okay, so great question. So because if when you guys submit, then the template is not as critical because you can actually assign pages to different homework problems. And so um, if you notice there was a subtle change in the instructions that went out with the PDF of the assignment, instead of saying you're signing to acknowledge that you are following the WMU um, academic integrity policies, um, I changed the wording to say by submitting to Gradescope or whatever the words were precisely, you're acknowledging that you're following those procedures. So at this point, actually, you don't need to um, even put a cover page on. Um, if, if if and when we continue to submit straight to Gradescope, you don't need to put a cover page on uh, because I'm going to implicitly understand that you have signed it by submitting it yourself and um, that you've uh, agreed to follow the WMU academic intensive policies. Uh, by the way, the other thing that I would like to mention is, um, you know, I want to explicitly tell you to not put identifiers on the pages. You know, I've had students who've been concerned in the past about you know potential biases that can creep in you know you you like this student you dislike that student and you know i unequivocally deny that i've ever um, been biased but there is such a thing as uh, unconscious bias and so as long as uh, we have the ability to anonymize what i'm grading we might as well use it so that so that that is not even a possibility anymore so 
Um, so don't put your identifiers on there. Don't put your win number or your name on the sheet uh, for any of the homework problems. Um, then I'm, I'm grading in a completely student blind manner, um, only assessing the work as it's presented. So I think that's great for everybody. Any other questions about grade scope? Okay, so the next, yeah, go ahead. If there's like a deadline, say if this were to be used for an exam, does the time that we assign the questions to what page is, does that count as part of the submission time or is it the time we upload it, then it's counted as being turned in on time? Yeah, so that's a good question, David. I, I appreciate that question as well. Um, the, the uh, I'm gonna say short term answer to that question is I, at this point, I have no intention of using grade scope for exams yet. Um, at least in the sense of uh, we're going to use e-learning for conducting the exam and then after that I might take the answers that you've put into e-learning and, and load those up on Gradescope for the grading aspect of it. I may do that, but you guys will not be uploading directly to Gradescope. Um, one of the nice things about e-learning, you know, e-learning is a great tool and I've used it for years and I like it. Um, it's not perfect. Um, you know, Gradescope for, for actually assessing student work, I think Gradescope seems to be better. Um, but but e-learning is great, and I'm going to continue to use it, particularly in this time of COVID where we can't do in-person exams uh, as easily, at least, um, because it has a pretty decent exam um, mechanism uh, for conducting, you know, this Respondus browser, the secure browser, is a way that has worked. It worked for two exams that I gave last semester. I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to continue to use that for the time being, um, unless I tell you something different. But I have no anticipation of changing that this semester. So getting, you know, David asked about the exam, so let's take that next bullet point. You all should have by now tried to, uh, you know, do the trial exam. It's actually called the quiz in e-learning. Uh, there were, I think, just a couple of questions. One was a true-false, the other was a multiple select. Um, hopefully it didn't take you really any time. Uh, but, you know, it was really meant as a check to make sure that you could use the secure browser feature um, and, and were able to assess that. Um, so uh, if you haven't done that uh, yet, I'm going to ask you immediately after class is over to go through and do that so I can confirm that all students are able to access the exam uh, with the features as intended. If, you know, what does this mean? It means you do have to have a camera in your computer or at least a webcam that you can attach to your computer. So if you haven't done it yet and you don't have that, then that's something you should try and get a hold of very quickly. Now we have a week to get it taken care of, so plenty of time for Amazon to deliver one to you or whatever your uh, choice is um, uh, of providers. But um, that's something that um, you, um, you know, you need to have uh, to do this exam. Um, I think, uh, so one other question that arose in office hours, it's my understanding that a significant number of you have a in-person class uh, that dismisses 10 minutes before this lecture were to start. Uh, so ends at 2.20 for the 2.30 um, exam start time. Um, so that is a bit of a challenge. Um, what I have determined based on the questions that I got on office hours this morning about it, I, I believe I can um, uh, put you through a start time and an end time. So for example, I will open the exam to begin at 2.30 and you can start the exam anytime between 2.30 and let's say 2.45 and then you'll have uh, the allotted time, um, you know, uh, what is it, 80 minutes, I guess, uh, nominally, um, that would start when you start, not starting at 2.30, but start when you start. Um, so I, I'm going to do that to give you guys a little bit more time to get out of that lecture, make sure you have your stuff taken care of, travel home if you need to, uh, get started um, without feeling quite as stressed and giving you a little bit more time to be uh, ready for the exam. So, um, so that's my... That's my attempt at sol uh, sol solving that problem. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions about that also. I got a question for you. Um, when I was doing the uh, quiz with the lockdown browser, 
my yeah. quiz came up only in the top left corner of my screen. I, it wouldn't allow me to fix it. And uh, it was really hard to see the, uh, the questions and such. I sent you an email with a picture to prove it, but um, is there any way to fix that or anything we can do about that? Uh, so that's the first I've heard of that report. I'm sorry I didn't get the email about it. I'll certainly look at it immediately after this lecture is over. Um, let me check in with the e-learning provider and see if this is something that uh, is common. So Ryan's asking, I, no, I don't know if you saw that, uh, Ryan, Ryan and Aiden both, and Garrett um, also had the same problem. Uh, looks like if you have two monitors, that may be it. Okay, I'll, I'll try that next time. Um, for those that want to try again, if you ran into this problem, um, I, I probably can reopen the exam for you, or if not reopen, at least just create another exam for you. So um, if uh, just send me an email if you're if you have that issue, send me an email and I'll put you on the list of people who can who can try again. I appreciate it. That'd be nice. Yeah, I. I Appreciate those who who have gone through and tried this. You know, this is this is a strange world. This COVID world. Uh, I, in some ways, distance learning I think is efficient and useful and and not great. But it's not. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. It's great in some ways, but it's not great in other ways. And and uh, the exam is one thing that I think is uh, a little bit challenging. And we're going to muddle through it. Um, and you guys' cooperation on these things is really appreciated. So uh, so thank you. Um, again, if you haven't done either of these things, then uh, stick around today at 4 o'clock um, and we'll address some of these issues. I did see that there was a question uh, earlier. Let me go back to it. Um, Nicole asked, uh, beam bending not being on the exam, will torsion be on the exam? So no. Uh, the first exam will cover the elasticity portions of the course, so it's covering essentially the homeworks that have already gone out and been returned by you guys, uh, the solutions that have been released. Um, and so uh, beam bending will not be on this exam. That'll be on the next exam and, and torsion as well. Okay, that brings me to the last announcement item here. Uh, that is that we're going to have a recitation section on Thursday at 4. You know, uh, we're a little pressed for time in, in our lectures um, because of the amount of content that's in this class, so it's hard to do a lot of examples. Uh, during, during lecture, we do a few here and there. I know that's a common theme is that students would like to have some more. So we're going to take an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how long it takes, on Thursday. We'll start right after class. We'll take a short break, you know, get some coffee or, or a beverage or whatever. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll get back together. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to go over the homework solutions um, that have been released already. I'll talk you through uh, anything that may have arisen. Um, you know, really I want you to be asking questions. I, I try hard to come up with fairly comprehensive solutions, but nevertheless sometimes um, uh, you know, what I think is clear and, and obvious may not be clear and obvious to you guys. I, I certainly want to address any questions that have arisen, anything that's uncomfortable in uh, the homework solutions that I've distributed. Um, and then assuming we get through all of those, then maybe I'll have a few more examples uh, that we could go through um, as well. Um, so I'm, I'm anticipating probably about an hour's worth of time, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how many questions arise during that period. Uh, hopefully, this will help you guys prepare for the exam. Um, you know, examples, I think, sometimes very helpful for exams where we spend a lot of time on theory and lecture. So, uh, 4 o'clock, uh, I will record that uh, as well, and that one I will uh, distribute to any students who maybe weren't able to make it. I know that there's a, f um, you know, there, there are conflicts that occur when the session is after hours. So um, we'll, we'll uh, get that distributed to anybody who needs it. Uh, any questions about that? Okay, so not hearing any, I'm going to anticipate that I can move forward. Uh, so my screen that displays your faces has all of a sudden kind of locked up. It happens every once in a while. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me before I continue. 
um, uh, somebody either chat in the window or yes okay thank you all right so here we go we're gonna jump back in um, uh, this is lecture 15 but actually uh, what we need to cover is in part 2 of lecture 14 in terms of the actual uh, linking uh, interlinking within the, the uh, system I'm using here so just to remind you where we were you know we were going through this problem where we were essentially trying to follow how much torsion occurs. Here I've got my torsion demonstrator. As I twist this structure, and really we're talking about solid bars, not hollow bars, and so the one that I have is, is hollow. So that's, um, it's not wrong what we're doing, but we'll actually get to better ways of analyzing hollow things in a little while. But anyway, what we found last lecture was that we, uh, Essentially, in order to solve this problem, um, we can use what's called the Prandtl stress function, okay? And that was this sort of obscure, um, not easily quantified function um, that, and, and when I say not easily, I mean it not intuitive. It takes a little bit of time and a lot of experience to really develop uh, uh, an understanding of how to just write down an appropriate function. And in fact, for many cross sections, you can't write down an appropriate function and we end up evaluating it numerically. Um, but, uh, you know, for many cross sections, we actually can write down a Prandtl stress function that then allows us to satisfy equilibrium, satisfy compatibility, satisfy stress uh, constitutive law and um, satisfy strain kinematics all kind of baked into this one function it is and all we've done is combined those other equations together into the Prandtl stress function and then ultimately we need to make sure that that function still satisfies the boundary conditions so it does everything but the boundary conditions and so um, you know, we started with this example where we looked at the outside surfaces of our structure, right? These are the portions of the structure that we're assuming are tr uh, uh, essentially traction-free. So we're applying torques on the faces of the shaft, and we're not applying any stresses on the uh, lateral surfaces of the shaft. And anyway, after we do that, um, we found this really interesting phenomenon that the value of the stress function we're calling that function phi. It's going to be constant on the boundary where there is no traction applied. And in fact, we're going to go ahead and make the argument that uh, in many cases, we can get away with just calling that zero on the boundary. Zero, of course, being a constant. OK, so that's kind of where we ended up last time. Um, and we then said, of course, well, it's not terribly interesting to know that this stress function satisfies the zero traction condition. That's, that's a necessity, but it's not interesting. What we would rather find is what the actual stress on the cross section is, and ultimately the resultant torque that those stresses integrate to achieve. Because much like beams want to carry bending load, shafts want to carry torsion load. So we need to relate this stress function phi to the torque resultant on the cross section. So how do we do it? Well, here's going to be our approach. On this cross section, again, this is uh, largely drawn from the textbook. The uh, we have a coordinate system which we've placed at the center of twist. And, rel and you know, what is the center of twist? Again, this is the point that doesn't move when it rotates. You know, there's only one point in the cross section that doesn't move when it rotates. All the other points move by some angle theta. And of course, because they're at some radius from the center of twist, r theta is a magnitude that's non-zero, whereas when r is zero, it doesn't move. So there's one location in this cross section where uh, there is no motion when it's twisting. Now, of course, we're going to integrate the differential torque 
over the area. And so here we've defined this uh, cross-sectional area with a differential area defined by dx and dy. And we say at this point that there is some, some shear stress that's present in this Prandtl stress function. Uh, you can see theoretically there could be two components. Um, keeping in mind that what we have, oh, what happened? There it is. Here's my shaft, right? This is the z-axis, is the long axis of the shaft. So the torques are on the z-face in either the x direction or the y direction. So tau zx, tau zy. They're shown here as yz and xz because, of course, it's symmetric. So, uh, you know, this is just the convention to go x, y, and z in that order. But nevertheless, they're on the z-face in the x direction or the z-face in the y direction. They're drawn as positive as you would anticipate. And what we're doing is calculating what contribution that shear stress has to a differential torque relative to our center of twist. And we can see that if we define positive as counterclockwise, that tau yz relative to our center of twist contributes a positive torque where the magnitude of that torque is the shear stress times the differential area, so that's differential force, tau dA is differential force, times moment arm relative to that center of twist, which in our case is just x. So from here to here, x times the differential force dA tau yz. Now similarly, with a slight caveat, we do the same thing with tau xz, again, it's a differential force, so differential area times stress is differential force times moment arm. In this case, the moment arm is y. The only difference is that this one, when positive, goes counter to the positive torque, so it actually has a minus sign. Okay, now last but not least, if you remember the way we defined the um, Prandtl stress function, we said it was some function, currently unknown, but some function where its derivative with respect to x is equal to minus tau yz, and its derivative with respect to y is equal to tau xz. That's what we defined it as last time, and so now we're just making those substitutions. d phi dx is equal to minus tau yz. Uh, d phi dy is equal to tau xz. So we, get, we end up with two minus signs here by the way that Prandtl function is defined. And then one is multiplied by x and one is multiplied by y. Both of them now multiply by the differential area to give us the total differential torque of this area. Now, to get the total torque, of course, all we have to do is integrate differential torque over the area. Okay, so total torque is the integral over the area. I'm going to write it as a double integral over dx and dy. dx dy is simply dA. Now of x d phi dx plus y d phi dy, I pulled the constant negative sign outside of the integral. Now, if you guys remember how to do integration by parts, that's the next step. So let me write that down here. So int by parts. If you don't remember that, that's essentially the integral of b dA is a b minus uh, b dA. Well, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the integral of a uh, dB is equal to b i minus b times the integral of dA. Anyway, that manifests itself over here as a portion that um, 
is still the integral portion of that. And then there is the portion that is evaluated as well. Okay, so in the end, this equation, the portion that becomes integrated be, uh, is now equal to 2 times the integral over the area. We've done it twice. 2 times the integral over the area of phi dx dy minus x phi evaluated at its limits of x1 and x2 and y phi evaluated at its limits of y1 and y2. Okay, so this, these are the integral terms that are evaluated at its limits. And this is the term that remains differential within. So phi still remains differential within the integral. Now we can evaluate these two functions, the right one, I'll underline this one first. This is the integral of this function evaluated from x1 to x2. Now if I were to draw our cross section, because this is a closed integral and we're integrating around the domain, x1 and x2 are in fact the same because it's the starting and the ending point of the integral and that value is the same. So therefore this integral becomes zero. Similarly, the y value again is the same as we go around this surface. And so y1 is equal to y2, and this integral also becomes 0. So what we find now is that the total torque, total torque of the, this is the resultant torque, really, over the whole cross-section is 2 times the integral of the stress function over the area. Okay, 2 times the integral of the stress function over the area. Now, this is useful, but we still don't know what that stress function is. We're, we've been pushing that off and off and off, kicking the can down the road. We still don't know what phi is, but we know that if it exists, and d phi d, you know, as, as we were talking about here, d phi dx is equal to minus tau yz, and d phi dy is equal to tau xz, if that function can exist, then the integral of that function over the area is one half the total torque. Okay, so we know that function will satisfy equilibrium. We know it'll satisfy com uh, compatibility requirements. Uh, we know it satisfies strain kinematics. We know it does all that stuff, we still don't know what it is, so the solution to the torsion problem is just about finding the stress function. And we know it has to be constant along the lateral boundary of the bar. Any questions on that? I know this is conceptually still a little bit frustrating because we don't know what phi is. We know what it does, we just don't know how to write it down. Okay, so a few notes here. After phi is determined, we can use phi actually to determine the center of twist. Okay, um, that, that's an interesting sidebar. We, we're not uh, going to do that very frequently in this class, but it certainly is something that's possible. Um, it's also worth noting that the out-of-plane displacement, that is the warping, can be obtained by integrating this because um, you know warping and the and the uh, function phi are related to each other. Now, uh, let's go ahead and move on. So this here, one slide summarizes what we have found. This is you know a good lecture's worth of material. <clears throat> boiled down to three equations. We know that we will satisfy compatibility and stress equilibrium 
when this holds, we know that we will satisfy torque equilibrium when this holds. We know we're going to satisfy our boundary conditions when this holds. And our challenge is to propose a phi and then go through and compare it to all of these and see if uh, the phi that we have proposed actually meets those criteria. Okay, clear as mud, right? Any questions? I think in order to really get this, we have to do examples. This is not something that becomes obvious just through um, discussion of the theoretical approach to it. So we're going to go ahead and do an example. And um, we're going to do the world's easiest example, of course, because that's uh, usually a good place to start. And, and then um, you're going to do some more examples as part of your homework uh, in order to, to prove that you can do this on your own as well. All right, so the question then becomes, what is the stress, strain, twist, parental stress function, total torque for a circular cross-section, solid, where on each end we have an applied torque? So we have the torque to... Uh, you know, the double headed arrow, double arrow headed line here indicates torque about that axis. So, in this case, torque about z axis with a straight, circular, solid cross sectional shaft. So, this is much like the drive shaft that might be in uh, your automobile or pickup truck, although sometimes those are hollow to make them more efficient. Certainly, this would be uh, similar in some ways to the crankshaft. Uh, of the or, or the really the prop shaft of an aircraft engine which would very likely be solid uh, if it's for a small engine okay so how do we do it <clears throat> you know again the whole point of the or the, the whole challenge really not the point but the whole challenge is to propose a stress function now that satisfies all those equations that we listed on the last slide so it becomes a challenge. How are we going to choose phi? What do we do? What do we come up with? Well, what do we know? We know one thing for sure. We know that it's going to be constant on the boundary. And we know, because I suggested it, that often we can use zero as our constant. So with that little piece of information, we can actually get a pointer to the right way to approach this problem. It's worth noting that the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared is equal to a squared. OK, so now a is the outer radius. I'm differentiating. I'm not calling it r, because there are going to be points where we're looking at radiuses r that are within the cross section. a is defining the outer limit of the cross section. So x squared plus y squared is equal to a squared. You guys are all quite familiar with that equation. Now, this equation then suggests something that we can use for coming up with our Prandtl stress function. That is, we can just manipulate this equation to make it equal to zero. So uh, the first thing that I might do is, uh, let's say, divide by a squared. So we get x squared over a squared plus y squared over a squared is equal to 1. And then we just shuffle the one over to the other side. And then that kind of shows up down here. x squared over a squared plus y squared over a squared minus 1. We know that the value in parentheses is always going to be equal to 0. When I say always, I mean on the boundary of our shaft. Not inside the shaft, but on the boundary of our shaft, that equation there, the thing in parentheses, will be equal to zero. So there, there you go. We have automatically satisfied the boundary condition statement associated with this technique. Um, note here that uh, 
we've multiplied by some arbitrary constant. Okay, c times zero is still going to be equal to zero, but now this gives us a little bit of flexibility in the problem to sort of figure out how to relate the magnitude of this function to the total torque that's applied. So there's our function. Let me go back here to this. So here we would make a check mark. We have uh, satisfied this equation already. Okay, so the next equation that we would like to satisfy is the compatibility equation. I've written it here as uh, number 51, equation number 51. For your reference, this is the same equation that we had looked at previously. Of course, now we know what phi is. I should have written that on this slide. So this is phi is equal to c times x squared over a squared plus y squared over a squared minus 1. Okay, if we look at that equation, um, we can take its derivative twice with respect to x and what falls out of that of course the second term and the third term go right away when we're taking derivatives with respect to x first derivative becomes 2cx over a squared second derivative remains 2c over a squared so uh, you know partial phi partial squared phi partial x squared is equal to 2c over a squared same story for the derivative with respect to y. We get a c times uh, 2y over a squared for the first, c times y over a squared for the second. So now we have that 2c over a squared plus 2c over a squared is equal to minus 2g theta. And from that, now we can actually solve for the unknown constant, c. And when we plug this in to that equation, then we know that this equation here is satisfied. Okay, I mentioned on the prior slide that once we have phi, we can find the center. And we can. And really what we're doing here is maximizing um, the uh, uh, or extreme really extremizing um, the uh, value of Phi extremizing the value of Phi okay so um, and what you would find here for this particular problem is that it's at the center <clears throat> shouldn't be a surprise uh, for the circle, the center of twist is likely to be at the center for a circular shaft. Okay, so we're going to go back two slides here. We have checked this box. That is the bottom equation. We have now checked this box. That's the top equation. What remains is the torque equilibrium equation. Sorry to whoever I hung up on there. That was my... Uh, WMU phone ringing through, but I didn't want to have it continue to make noise for us. Uh, okay, so here we have uh, torque. This is the equation. That is the total torque is 2 times the integral over the area of the function phi. I have now put that function phi in here. I've left the C just to make the mathematics slightly easier. We're writing fewer things down. It's also worth noting that, you know, what we have in here, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So I mentioned earlier that we have these points. So here I, I can look at this point here which is at some radius, it's inside the outer radius, it's at some point x, y, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, so I have simplified this integral ever so slightly, and now this is the total torque. All right, I'm going to uh, let this reside on the screen here just so I'm not moving too fast. While it's still there, uh, do we have any questions from the audience?
Could you explain one more time why you were able to switch it to R squared? Sure, yeah. So this is a rather famous equation. X squared plus Y, y squared is equal to R squared. Okay, so that one you should sort of maybe just remember, but even if you can't remember it, we can just derive it. Um, that is, so if this, at some point, if this, so if this is our origin here, and we've got a length x, you know, this is a vector, so a vector of length x here, uh, y there, and r here, um, you know, the this is just the x squared plus y squared, the, the uh, vector of length, the, the length of r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So that's a you know geometry argument that you um, have encountered probably since you were in, in high school. So um, uh, even if it's not something that you just have on the back of your head, you can rederive that. I do want to draw the distinction because it could be confusing that remember a is the outer boundary. A is the outer boundary, and we're distinguishing R from A. So uh, don't be confused about that. Okay, so I think you guys probably are all with me now. So what, what we see here, I, I gotta go back one more time. So this is an interesting uh, equation, and it actually is suggestive of something you've probably heard of, uh, but maybe didn't really pull all together until uh, this point in your careers. And that is this term, which we have called J. It is a property of the cross section. By name, we call it the polar second moment of the area. Okay, it's almost like the area moment of inertia with respect to X or the area moment of inertia with respect to y. In fact, it's very much related to both of those two things uh, because, you know, just, uh, just for reference here, so if we said i y was equal to the integral of x squared dA, okay, and we had i x was equal to the area, or the integral of y squared dA, and then you did x squared plus y squared, the integral of that dA, you get j. Okay, x squared plus y squared is r squared. It actually happens to work out quite nicely to be related very directly to, to these two integrals, ix and iy. It's really just the sum of those two integrals. But now, you know, we compute these independently usually, although you could compute those, add them together, and get j if you wanted to. But typically, we're, we're computing them differently because when we're computing them, we, we tend to um, compute, uh, you know, bending. We, we tend to completely isolate bending and torsion and axial load. That's one of the great benefits of using beam theory is we can isolate the axial load from the bending, we can isolate the bending from the torsion, and then of course, because those two are isolated, you get the third one for free. That is, you isolate the axial load from the torsion. Okay, so they're related, not the same, related. Anyway, what does it look like? J is defined as the integral of R squared dA. And it fell out of this computation because it's only a portion of it. But here in this integral, we have the integral of r squared dA. Okay, now keep in mind, um, let me go to the blackboard here for a minute. We're going to do a change of coordinate system. And I'm going to instead go to an r theta coordinate system. And what we're going to find here is that if this is our new dA, okay, by contrast to the dA we had before, which was going to be dy and dx, if we switch into an r theta coordinate system, we want instead r to be expressed, I'm sorry, a, dA to be expressed in terms of r and theta. 
And so this distance from inside radius to outside radius we're going to call dr. And this magnitude here, the length as we sweep through d theta, so the angle is d theta, but the length is r d theta. So this arc length is the radius times d theta. So dA in this context, by changing coordinate systems, is going to be equal to r times dr d theta. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're going to make that substitution into this equation. So dA becomes r dr d theta, which of course makes this integral r cubed dr d theta. And then the bounds of your integral now become uh, 0 and a as we integrate out from the origin to the edge, and 0 to theta 2 pi as we integrate or, uh, over theta. So we change, as, as we did this change of variables, we also changed the limits of the integral. And then once we've done those two things, lo and behold, what kicks out of this is this equation. J is equal to 1 half pi A squared. Uh, professor, would you be able to pull up that drawing that you did uh, showing how you uh, change the dA into R, dr, d theta? Yeah, it's that one. I also have a question about like the double integral symbol. Uh, is it just two integral symbols because you know you're doing the area so it's gonna be dx and dy or dr and d theta, so it's. Yeah, so that's why I put the double integral there. Now in practice, uh, you know, you can choose a notational scheme so long as it's uh, clear to you exactly what you're doing. And so, you know, in some circumstances in the class, uh, you know, for example, um, one of them being where we did, you know, ix was the integral of y squared dA. You know, it probably, to be as complete as possible, could have been the double integral of y squared dx dy. Um, in, in this case, I'm actually actively calling it a double integral so as to specifically remind you guys that you have to pull this r into this equation. So a common error for students in exams and in homework sets is to say that dx dy is equal to dA, which then is equal to dr d theta. This is a common error, but is actually not true. In order to get to dA, you need to mult. This needs to be two lengths. So dr is a length. d theta is not a length. It's a change in angle. You need an r in front of it in order to make it an arc length. So r d theta is a length. Uh, dr is obviously a length. And so um, this, I, I would say that in in years where I haven't explicitly highlighted this issue. Uh, for you guys as students, I would say that this error has shown up, um, you know, in at least 25% or more of student homework. Um, so it's a common error. It's an easy mistake. I've made that mistake oh, countless times when I was in my uh, younger days before it, it really got tattooed on my brain and I, I haven't forgotten in a while, but uh, it's an easy mistake to make. So um, I, I want to highlight that for you. Oh, by the way, I've, I've uh, given many, uh, over the years, given many quizzes where um, this change of variables issue was tested in the quiz. Uh, so hint, hint, if, if we get a quiz where you're doing a change of coordinate systems, hopefully you guys will never make that mistake um, in that quiz. Um, but uh, yeah, just be aware. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to continue forward. So now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this value j into, we're going to replace the integral with j in the prior equation. 
And when we do that, I'll go back to that equation here for a second. So I'm replacing this integral with j. It's also worth noting, of course, that the integral of 1 dA is equal to a, the area, so that's pi r squared, or in this case, pi a squared. And so, um, and, and of course, j itself, as we have now seen, has a to the fourth in it. So uh, when we make this substitution, we're going to end up canceling a, a couple of those powers. So a to the fourth over a squared becomes a squared. Uh, the integral here of 1 becomes an a squared quantity. And lo and behold, you put these two things together, and here's what you get. The total torque is equal to, after completing the integral, 2c times j over a squared minus a. That's not simplified yet. Uh, it will need to be simplified before the answer is complete. Um, uh, just a note, when I'm uh, grading uh, homeworks or exams, um, you know, do your best to simplify your answers down to the most clear and um, concise form, so sort of as brief as it can be represented. I do recognize that that um, is not necessarily the most important thing to do on an exam, so I'm a little bit more forgiving of that in exams, but I would ask that in homework you do your best to simplify these things down uh, to make it as easy to understand what you've done as possible. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do that simplification now. <clears throat> so obviously the area is pi a squared. We can multiply pi a squared by a squared, and that ends up working out to be equal to 2j. Alternatively, what we could have done is we could have, you know, solved this. Uh, I mean, there are a num number of ways to simplify that. In the end, what we get is this equation. The total torque is equal to minus 2cj over a squared. And of course, we do already know c. And so substituting the value of c into the equation, we get that the total torque is equal to gj times theta. Anybody remember what theta is? The angle of twist? Yeah, it's the, well, in fact, it's not the angle of twist, it's the rate of twist. It's the derivative of the angle of twist with respect to the z-axis. So, you know, I want to distinguish two things. One is the total twist, and one is the derivative of that with respect to this axis, and theta is the derivative form. Uh, I, I've just now realized that when we did this equation, uh, we said RDRD theta. This theta is distinct from the other theta, okay? This is now in an area integral sense as opposed to this theta, which is the um, uh, in the sense of the rate of twist. It's interesting that this is really the first time I've ever noticed that, and I've been teaching this class for a long time, so these things slip by. I apologize about that if it has caused confusion. Um, hopefully now that we've addressed it, it won't be confusing if it was before. Okay, so what's interesting about this is now we have a quantity, which we're going to call G and J, that's very similar to another quantity we had called E and I. G, J, E, I. Now, what do I mean by similar? Okay, in each case, we have a modulus times a property of the cross-section. So we have a material component in the modulus, and we have a material distribution component or an area distribution component in the um, moment of inertia term. So we actually, when we have a con constant material property, we have a nice clean separation between material contribution 
and geometric contribution. And oh, by the way, the form these equations takes is very similar. So the one that we've just developed is torque is equal to gj times the derivative of alpha. In this case, we're saying alpha prime is equal to uh, d alpha dz, which we also have called theta. So I've called it three separate things here in one slide. So um, you know, just recognize that to be true. Torque is equal to gj alpha prime. Moment is equal to ei, I'm going to say v prime. So this is bending about the x-axis. Here I'm saying v double prime is, this, is the second derivative. So partial squared of uh, v partial z squared. Now we don't actually need to draw a strong distinction between partial derivatives and full derivatives because in, in this equation we're referencing v to the centroidal axis, um, which now is not a function of x and y. Um, I just left it in partials because that's the way it's been expressed in the past. So anyway, uh, these two terms are very valuable. One is a bending rigidity, also sometimes called bending stiffness. One is a torsional rigidity sometimes called torsional stiffness, uh, that relates a generalized load, the moment, to the generalized displacement, in this case the curvature, or the generalized load, the torque, to the generalized displacement, the rate of twist. This analogy between the two actually starts to highlight how similar beam bending is to shaft torsion, Really, the only difference is uh, an order of magnitude in this differential equation, which in the end is going to show up as two orders of magnitude in the overall governing differential equation. Okay, so now that we know that, <clears throat> by the way, so let's go back. Boom. Checkbox number three is satisfied. We now have an equation that gives us everything we need. How did we find phi? You know, it's worth revisiting that. Well, this is something, it's not necessarily intuitive. It takes some practice, it takes some experience. Um, I would encourage you guys to think through some of these problems, uh, see if you can develop that intuition that's necessary here in this example. I've. I just took advantage of the area of a circle, or I should say um, the radius of a circle, the definition of the radius of a circle, and use that to my advantage to write down phi. Um, it's not always that easy, but often it is that easy. I have a question. Yep. Who's, who's that? I can't see you right it's now. Steve. On the previous slide, how did you know to multiply times c and not something that's not linear? if it would still be zero in the end, no matter what you multiply by. Uh, you said the prior slide. Let's get to this. So first of all, highlight here. I'm going to highlight what C is since we're going to use that. Okay. So here's C, which we solved from the compatibility equation. Okay. Now what, ask again, where, where was it that you were uh, asking your question? On your initial assumption. How did you come up with an, an assumption that C is just C and not multiplied times some variable when you made your initial assumption that it has to satisfy oh. the condition where it's equal to, yeah, that one right there. Yeah, okay. So what do we know? We said I was assuming a function. What I needed to make this function look like was something that would go to a constant value, preferably zero on the boundary preferably zero in this example, although not always. Constant value. So what I knew was that what's in parentheses is a constant value. It's zero because we know that it's related to this definition. Now, what's a little bit problematic about that is that it doesn't allow us any flexibility to have generality in this assumed form. Okay, so if, you know, the, the point really that I'm trying to make here is it needs to be of 
a value that we know goes to zero on the boundary, but it can't be zero everywhere. And in fact, we don't know a good magnitude to apply to it yet at this point. Okay, so I multiplied the whole thing by an arbitrary magnitude and then eventually used the next equation to actually establish the magnitude. So I gave myself some uh, flexibility. You know, if you then, if you were to go back and plug this into that equation, okay, I would have to guess some additional terms here, and I would argue, well, I'm not sure that even after years of doing these problems that I would have had the intuition to guess precisely what that multiplying coefficient should have been. And really, there's no reason I need to. I can just make an arbitrary coefficient and then determine it. that makes sense, David? Yes, thank you. All right. Okay, uh, let's see where we were now. Uh, I think we were here. So anyway, uh, lo and behold, now we've, we've kind of done it all, actually. We have a value for phi. This is that stress function, right? Um, we know that it satisfies the boundary conditions. We know it satisfies stress equilibrium, uh, torsion equilibrium. We know it satisfies kinematics. We know it satisfies... Uh, the, um, oh, what was the last thing I didn't say? Uh, I'll go back up here. I think I said, uh, oops. Yeah, compatibility, stress equilibrium, torque equilibrium. I'm not sure I said torque equilibrium. We know it satisfies the boundary conditions. Okay, so we know that that value is something that, if used, will satisfy all the requirements of elasticity theory. However, we do not yet know what the actual torques are, or I should say what the actual stresses are. Okay, now going back to what we knew as our definition of the function is that it had to satisfy both of these boxed equations. That's what uh, uh, Prandtl's great brilliance was, is he, he recognized that this would work if and only if this were true, that these two equations were satisfied. Now that we know what phi is, we can directly compute its derivative. So d phi dy is going to be equal to 2c times y squared over a. d phi dx is going to be equal to minus 2c times x over a squared. And so what we get now is a shear stress, two components, of shear stress that have a very specific magnitude. One is minus g times the rate of twist times the distance in the y direction from the center of twist. The other one is similarly g times the rate of twist times the distance in the x direction from the center of twist. So again, if I were to draw our circle, here's our center of twist. I'm evaluating the stress at this location. It is now a function of how far it is vertically and horizontally from the center of twist. Sort of the further it gets away from that, uh, not sort of, in practical practicality, the further it gets away from the center of twist, the higher the overall stress will be in magnitude. And of course, you're trading components in the x and the y directions. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we move on? I have a quick one, Professor. Um, yes, you sir. mentioned phi could be used to um, find the center of twist. Is there a situation where that wouldn't be finding the centroid? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, many circumstances, actually. Um, uh, I would say, as a general rule, um, I would be uh, fairly surprised to see that it was the same for anything that's a um, that lacks some symmetry to it. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, yeah. Two separate calculations, centroid and, and center of twist. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how many times I've... That sounds like a great homework question, actually, Jeremy. Maybe, maybe you've just created the next homework set for us. 
Okay. Uh, moving on, we've computed, we did the whole shebang, right? We did it for um, uh, the solid shaft. We can now actually look at the stress distribution in the bar. This is another interesting twist on the same problem. Okay, we still have this solid shaft. Uh, it's still circular in cross section. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some equilibrium cuts. Okay, so here I've got a solid shaft. Uh, let me do it on a different sheet here. So here I've got a solid circular shaft, and it goes off in this direction. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take an equilibrium cut inside the shaft of some differential length dz, uh, where I'm incorporating everything up to some radius r. It's still an equilibrium cut. So it's, you know, we, we've created this internal interface. Okay, and that's what the left-hand side is. We'll focus on the right-hand side in a subsequent set of slides. Um, for now, we're going to focus on the left-hand side. So now what do we know? We know a few things. <clears throat> One of the things that we're really going to be interested in is what are the tractions internally within the shaft. So no longer are we interested in the tractions on the exterior surface of the shaft, which we said were traction free, i.e. the traction is zero vector. Now we're looking at the tractions internal to the shaft. Okay, we still have the same equation that we had previously. That is the Cauchy equation where we have zero components of stress uh, for a number of the components, two non-zero components, at least two um, unique non-zero components due to the symmetry of this matrix. Now we're going to define a new thing that's the normal to this new surface that we've created by creating this cut. Okay, and at some point normal uh, to that surface, we're going to have components nx and ny of a total vector n. So that's what's showing up here on the right-hand side. And of course, we have now our traction components, units of stress per area on this exterior surface. In, uh, it's internal to the shaft, external to our cut. Okay, and of course, taking the, you know, just multiplying this matrix times this vector, which is, you know, the dot product of that, we're going to end up with Tx is equal to zero, Ty is equal to zero, and last but not least, Tz is equal to Txznx plus Tyzny. Uh, what else do we know? Well, we also happen to know, you know, we need to more accurately define our uh, components of our traction vector and more specifically the normal vector. So the next step of this process would be to write down what the normal is. And if I go back up one slide here, we can see at this point that I've shown that the components are related to sine and cosine of this angle beta that shows up on the slide. So there's our angle beta. Obviously, uh, this is sine of beta. This is cosine of beta time, in each case, both times our radius for this total length. And then you normalize that. And so you end up with just sine and cosine, such that nx is equal to cosine of beta, ny is equal to sine of beta. So we can now go plug these two values into the equation above, and there's no trick to that, really. <clears throat> so um, here we have, uh, oh, by the way, we've also computed, uh, I didn't highlight it, but it's worth noting that we've computed tau xz and tau yz based on the uh, parental stress function that we have already shown you. So that was the bulk of the lecture was how to compute those. So now we know nx and ny in addition to those. And so we can now look at and write tau z is equal to this, uh, this total equation here, which is minus g theta y nx plus g theta x ny, which works out to be 
uh, g theta y cosine beta plus g theta x sine of beta, which just ends up being equal to minus g theta y x over r plus g theta x y over r, and you add those two terms together and you get zero. So what do we know? We know the traction component in the z direction is zero. What have we concluded? The radial shear stress vanishes. Now I need to make this a little bit more clear. So I need to go back to our prior drawing. Let me go ahead and zoom in on this image. If at this point we drew our components, much like we drew with a parallelopiped earlier, um, in fact, let me go ahead and do that for you as well because I think this is a helpful analogy. Remember how we've always done this where tau xy and yx, uh, uh, we, we show them in this way and the arrow is always pointing to the corner in order to have the magnitudes of those things be uh, the same, um, uh, the signs of those things be the same. So we can do the same thing with this corner down here, so right corner, left corner, any corner, uh, we know that there is an equivalence between the shear stress on one side and the shear stress on the other side. Now we've done that same thing here, where we have tau z. I'm going to call it tau z, so that's a shear stress oriented in the z direction. And we have tau rz, so on the z face in the r direction. And once again, let me just zoom in on that so that it's a little bit clearer. We're looking up here. So we have, um, you could think of this as, as R face Z direction, Z face R direction. Uh, we're just calling tau Z to be the traction component TX, TY, TZ uh, at that location. And that ends up being this tau Z down here, which ends up being equal to zero. And so therefore, we can conclude, since tau z was equal to tau z, n was equal to rz, what we're seeing is that the radial component of shear stress is zero. Okay, so, you know, you can now sit back and just think of that intuitively. We're not having a shear stress that radiates outward from the center. Okay, and that's going to be true for this circular shaft, solid shaft. There is no shear stress that radiates outward from the center. Okay, now moving forward and we're running short on time, uh, bear with me for a minute. We took a few minutes at the beginning to talk about the exam and such, so we're, we're just a touch behind where I'd like to otherwise be. Um, so just a few more minutes of your time, if you would indulge me. Um, we can now look at the right-hand side. This is going to be the same set of arguments that we made before. We're now going to identify a Z component tau Z. Uh, that's the Z as in tau x, tau y, tau, tau z, that, so that's the um, uh, you know, z component of the traction vector. And I'm now going to have this new term just called tau. Okay, and let me zoom in here. We're looking now at this term. We found out tau rz was equal to zero. Really the only thing left is um, you could think of this as uh, theta uh, you know, tau oriented in the R face in the theta direction, or we're just going to ultimately call it, call it the shear stress because it's really the only non-zero uh, shear stress that remains. So tau is the only shear stress that's non-zero in the problem. So we'll just leave calling it tau. 
um, or you could think of it as a tau uh, z theta. Okay, um, anyway, so now the difference we have here, uh, previously we had nx and ny components. We're actually now changing the components because now the normal is in the theta direction rather than in the r direction. And so nx becomes sine of beta and ny becomes minus cosine of beta. Previously, nx was, um, uh, you know, sine of beta and we had cosine of uh, beta for the other one. Anyway, so we get this y over r and minus x over r as our components of uh, the traction vector, or I should say of the normal vector. And so knowing what we know, we plug in our known values of tau xz, we plug in our known values of nx, known values yz, known values ny, and this ends up being equal to, tau z is equal to minus g theta times r. So what is this? This is what we're going to call the tangential shear stress. It's the only non-zero shear stress for this particular problem. Because it's the only one, you know, by convention, it's just called tau as opposed to having subscripts associated with it. We're going to make it uh, a minus sign of this uh, for some consistency so that positive stresses in one direction are sort of consistent with what expectation would be. And so tau is equal to g theta times r. Again, what's the conclusion from this? It's what I alluded to in the prior statement I made, that the further you are from the center of twist, the higher the stress, and it's shear. G theta, so G is a material modulus, theta is a rate of twist, the derivative of alpha with respect to Z, R. So the further you get away from the center of twist, the higher the stress. We can calc, you know, if you, Plug in the torque is equal to G J theta equation. Uh, to this equation, we can solve for this stress. And simply the total shear stress at any point in the cross section is the total torque times R over J. Um, you know, as a little reminder for you, we also had this equation for one bending about the X axis. Sigma, the bending stress, was my over i. Here we have the shear stress is equal to tr over j. So again, these are directly analogous to each other, two very important equations for you to have in your toolkit. I would challenge you to memorize these so that you can recall them at any point uh, when you have need for this type of solution. Um, great things to uh, write on a formula sheet if you're allowed a formula sheet for an exam. Uh, probably, actually, as I said, can you know, if you're going to be a structural engineer, you need to just tattoo it on the back back of your brain and and use it for the rest of your life. Okay, so we're at the end of today's lecture. Um, the last slide for this cross-section, that is a circular cross-section. It can be shown that W is equal to zero. Uh, there is no warping for a circular cross-section. No warping for a circular cross-section. However, um, this is of course not a general statement. There is warping for uh, other cross-sections as you would anticipate. Just a reminder what warping is, that's the Z direction projection, right? So it's the, as I twist this thing, it's how much it moves that in that direction within the cross section. Okay, that'll be it for today's lecture. I'm gonna hang out here for a little while, uh, take any questions about the lecture. We'll do those first. And then uh, when you guys are satisfied that those questions have been answered, then um, stick around for anybody who's having trouble with the grade scope submission or the exam, uh, the practice quiz, I should say, practice exam. So questions, first questions about the, the lecture.
Okay, I'm not hearing any questions about the lecture. Let me just double check in the chat window. It doesn't look like any questions were asked in the chat window either. So I will dismiss those who don't need uh, to discuss the uh, grade scope submission or the, the uh, exam. I'll see you guys next, I guess it's uh, Thursday of this week, two days from now, I'll see you then. Um, otherwise, for those who might have had trouble, stick around here.